The Big Bang model is supported by four important pieces of evidence. One of them is the redshift of absorption lines in the light spectra from galaxies at large distances. This redshift that is shown here is due to the relativistic Doppler effect. The picture shows a continuous spectrum of the visible spectrum of light, discrete emission lines and the equivalent absorption lines as they would be observed in the laboratory. Right at the bottom a spectrum that is redshifted with these absorption lines shifted to larger wavelengths to the red. This shift occurs because the stellar object that emits this spectrum moves away from us. In order to understand this redshift two velocities have to be considered. The velocity of light at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and the speed of the stellar object, for example a galaxy that moves away from us. The superposition of both velocities causes a Doppler effect. The effect needs to be treated relativistically using the theory of special relativity. The relativistic Doppler effect is similar to the classical acoustic Doppler effect with which we are familiar. The classical effect was first discussed by Christian Doppler from Salzburg in 1842 and then published in 1846. This early photograph shows him with a scientific instrument. On the left is a print of the publication in which he discusses the classical Doppler effect. The main topic of the paper is the visible spectrum from binary stars. When an ambulance passes us, we hear the siren first with a high pitch and when it departs from us then with a lower pitch. This is exactly the classical Doppler effect and it can be quantified using this equation here which shows the frequency that we hear as a function of the frequency at rest when the ambulance is at rest and the siren sounds then multiplied with the fraction of the speed of sound c divided by the speed of sound plus or minus the velocity of the car. The sign depends on the relative direction of the velocity of sound and the velocity of the ambulance. When the ambulance moves away from us the sign is a plus sign so that the fraction becomes smaller and the frequency perceived is less than the frequency at rest. In the case of a receding star or a receding galaxy the situation is very similar. The Earth takes the place of the observer, that's where we are, and the star takes the place of the ambulance moving away from us. So we would expect that the frequency of the light in this case is reduced and uh, instead of the speed of sound c we now have to apply the speed of light in vacuum which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. However one big difference is that now we cannot treat the situation using the Galilei transformation and classically we have to use special relativity and apply the Lorentz transformation. The equivalent equation can be derived by first considering the reference frame of the star. In this reference frame the proper frequency is observed as if the um, light was emitted in a laboratory, in a fixed laboratory. However it appears that the wavefronts as they reach Earth at that very large distance are spaced further apart than they would be spaced in the laboratory because the star is moving away as the wavefronts are arriving at Earth. The time interval between the arrival of two such wavefronts is thus given by lambda divided by c, the speed of light, minus v, which is the relative velocity between Earth and the star. Using the standard equation for waves Propagation speed equals the product of wavelengths and frequency, which is always true. 
one can modify this equation and obtains that the time ts is given by c divided by c minus v times the frequency. Introducing the parameter beta, which is a parameter of special relativity and defined as speed divided by speed of light, one obtains that the time between the arrival of two wavefronts is 1 over 1 minus beta times the frequency in the stellar system. This equation may be start so that we can use it later. We now look at the situation from the system Earth, from the reference system Earth, where the observed time is um, labeled T0 and the frequency as it is observed is labeled F0. Because the observer measures a time dilation since the source moves away, due to special relativity, the observed time interval is given as the proper time interval Ts divided by gamma, whereby gamma is another parameter of special re relativity which is defined as 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. In step 4, the time, the observed time on Earth, is converted to a frequency by taking the inverse and um, then replaced using the double start equation that includes the time dilation. That gives us for the observed frequency gamma divided by the time interval as observed on the star. Now substituting for gamma with 1 over square root of 1 minus beta squared and finally substituting with the star equation from the previous slide we obtain that the observed frequency is equal to the proper frequency fs times 1 minus beta divided by the square root of 1 minus beta squared. Using some algebra, the familiar equation of F0 equals Fs times the square root of 1 minus beta divided by 1 plus beta is obtained. This result gives the relativistically correct description of the astrophysical cosmic redshift. Since in both systems the speed of light is constant and given as the product of wavelengths and frequency, one can express the astrophysical redshift also in terms of wavelengths as it is shown here and one obtains that the observed wavelengths on Earth is equal to the proper wavelengths on the star times the square root of 1 plus beta divided by 1 minus beta. Since the proper wavelengths is known from laboratory experiments and the actual wavelengths can be observed, the relative speed between Earth and the receding galaxy can be determined. This was first done by Hubble in 1929. His original data set extended only a few megaparsecs into the cosmos. Since then many more such measurements have been performed and an illustration of the results is given in the diagram at the bottom left. Plotted here is the measured recession speed v of the star or galaxy as a function of the distance that can be determined independently and it is apparent that the two v and distance r given in megaparsecs have a linear relationship with a defined slope h. The constant of proportionality between v and r has been named the Hubble constant. The accepted value of this constant is 22 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second per light year. More recently it was found that at even larger distances, at of the order of 1000 megaparsecs, the data obtained for 1a supernovae deviates from a linear relationship as illustrated there. This is strong evidence that the Hubble constant in earlier times of the universe was different. It is now larger, therefore the expansion of the universe is accelerating. This is an exciting observation which may be explained if a new type of matter is assumed to exist which we don't yet understand. It's referred to as dark energy and it has gravitational properties, however the gravitational force is not attractive but repulsive.
The Hubble law and the observed nonlinearity for large distances and early times of the universe has important consequences for our understanding of the Big Bang cosmology. Principally, there are four possibilities that are illustrated on this view graph. Ignoring the acceleration, three situations are possible. The matter density can be such that it slows down the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang, followed by expansion, is then followed again by a so-called Big Crunch, where the um, matter of the entire matter of the universe comes together again and forms a Big Crunch singularity out of which, for example, another Big Bang might follow and a second universe could occur. A special case, a critical universe, can also happen where the matter density is such that the expansion comes to rest in infinity. That is shown as the second cartoon from the left. The third cartoon shows the situation where the matter density is even less so that the universe never comes to a rest. However, due to the attractive property of matter, as we know it, no other situation is possible. An acceleration is only possible if a new type of matter exists. This is shown with the cartoon on the right, where the expansion of the universe accelerates. This would require the existence of a new type of matter, referred to as dark energy, which is anti-gravity or repulsive. The search for evidence for dark energy and a better understanding of its property is an exciting topic of current research. We can hope that soon more information on dark energy and the matter density of the universe is available so that we can decide which of those four possibilities describes our cosmos best.